Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this session with David Gumbrell. I hope we've attended the first session that we have ran last month. Uh, but David will now introduce himself and we'll get on the way. Thank you. Well, good morning, colleagues, and uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, come and be with us this morning. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this session. Um, so as uh, Paul was saying, my name is David Gumbrell, um, and I used to be a head teacher. Did, um, I was a head teacher for seven years um, in a primary school in Surrey. Uh, prior to that, I was a, a class teacher and deputy head and senior leader and computing lead um, in a variety of schools across Surrey. Um, but my big passion was about looking after the people who are in school. As a head teacher, I was, um, and as looking after um, NQTs, I was, and I still am. That's what my, my passion and my drive is, is to consider the individual trying to do their job. And that's why I'm really pleased that you've taken the time to give yourself this moment, this short window of opportunity to allow yourself to consider and to think about your own well-being. As Paul was saying, uh, we've done um, a number of different resilient sessions, and I don't know, unless you let me know in the chat, um, whether you had attended any of those, but I believe that they are still available um, for those who want them. The underlying message is uh, consistent, and that message is in order to look after other people and to complete our role as we would want it to be completed, we have to look after ourselves. And this idea of self-compassion is a real and is a genuine thing. And so today, um, we're gonna look at the second of the four um, elements of well-being that the NAHT are running with um, over the course of this academic year and intellectual well-being. And what research tells us folks is that intellectual well-being is an essential part of um, an essential part of well-being that you're all clever people you're all clever people because you couldn't have got into the role that you got yourself into and as a result of that you still need to exercise this muscle you still need to give yourself some intellectual exercise and that this is all part of well-being if you can satiate your mind with intellectual pursuit, then this is very comforting for us. We like it. We think that it, it, it helps us to calm us. I know that I'm probably one of the most curious people there is, and I take on all sorts of challenges and want to find out about things from the past. So for example, I was asked at my teacher training university that I work at to teach a, less, a, teach a lecture um, on the Spitalfields, the area of London. And now I knew very little about Spitalfields, but I had a month uh, prior to that lecture. And so I decided to take on that challenge and learn about Spitalfields, the area of London. And what I discovered was a whole raft of um, interest and intrigue about an area that, to all intents and purposes, I hadn't even explored before. But I got interested, I got curious, my brain was whirring, not on work things for a change, not on school for a change, not on the pedagogy of education for a change, not on Ofsted changes for a change, but just things that interested me. And I think that this is what today is all about. And hopefully as you're leading into half term, that you can consider what would you like to learn about? What could pique your interest? Where could you go next in terms of your own learning? Because I think if we do, you're gonna be in a better place. Thank you for the colleague who, uh, uh, who had attended the first session. And thank you for your kind words about that session. Um, I'm hoping that this will be um, this will be equally as useful for you, but thank you for that comment. 
I guess that some, for some of you, uh, you would have immediately recognised uh, the symbology that I've used on this title slide. Does anybody know? Anybody want to claim that claim that prize in the in the chat box and type in what it is? I deliberately chose it. Haha, -ha, very trivial indeed. Well done, well done, colleague. It is indeed. And we're going to dive back into that in a minute because I think that's an unfortunate phrase, isn't it? Because trivial almost becomes a kind of negative association about knowledge and i think there is information that isn't interesting um in its in it in when it's um when it's taken out of context if we don't have anything to latch it onto but i think if we can contextualize learning then we can really get interested and curious so let's see um where we get to Last time, for those of you who weren't there, we looked at the idea of occupational well-being. And what we came down to was the idea that um, we needed emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence runs with these five areas. Empathy, social skill, and then importantly, where we dived in quite a lot around self-awareness and self-regulation. So last time we really tapped into the, the idea that self is a prefix and that we needed to look after ourselves in order to be the leader that we wanted to be. And so hopefully that's a nice reminder for folk who weren't able to attend um, last time. And then we're gonna dive into motivation. Now motivation is what keeps us going. Motivation is something that gives us impetus or momentum. And we identify this for teachers, as for students, but sometimes we don't identify this for ourselves. But I would hedge my bets here and say that we could all be motivated if we could find an intellectual challenge that sparks our interest, sparks our attention, sparks our desire for knowledge whatever that may be. And it could be something as simple as a David Attenborough documentary. It could be about Spitalfields, the area in London, but it could be a whole raft of different things. What I know about and what I think I might want to know about may well be different to what you want to know about. And we might go about finding that information in different ways, but we are consistent in the desire, I hope, and the motivation that we get from that of learning. Otherwise, why would we be in the job that we're in? But we need to keep learning in order to um, inspire others to want to keep learning as well. So we looked last time at the why, the how, and the what. Why do you do what you do? How do you do what you do? And importantly, why do you do what we do? And we looked at Daniel Goldman's leadership competencies around self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationships management. And these are elements <clears throat> of well-being and amongst that we realized that we needed to look after ourselves and that could be through photography on the left that could be through cooking and um, I'm going to come back to that at the end because my daughter's into cooking and she comes up with ingredients that I've never heard of before um, in the recipes that she uh, that she explores but that's good it's learning something new not only for her but also for me and then we're going to come on to the orangutan at the bottom there. Um, I don't know if you recognise that advert, but uh, those of you who do um, will be rewarded later on when we get to that point. But certainly, bottom right is the idea of knowledge and information. I'll give you that bit for free um, at this point. Now I'm a big fan of Daniel Goleman and Daniel Goleman 
says this. So have a read of this statement for yourself. Now, it was a while ago, wasn't it? 1999 was a while back. But I think it still has validity. I think it still has worth that motivation does include the joy of doing something, curiosity in learning. What are you curious about? What are the areas that you, well, potentially you might say, oh, I used to be, when I had time, I, we put these caveats in um, during the summer holidays, I, comma, as a front, um, as, as a, as a clause at the beginning of the sentence. But what are you interested in or what were you interested in? Or arguably what you could be interested in? Because this is about building for the future rather than chastising ourselves for what's currently happening. But curiosity is a good thing, folks. Basically, that's what I'm trying to get across. And I hope it's coming across to you. When we're trying to define wellness, many people have many def definitions of what that might be, or many divisions. I chose this one because, purely because it's linked to the trivial pursuit um, and the kind of pie pieces or wh whatever you call them um, in your household. Um, so that's why I chose this one in particular. And what is clear is that regardless of what dimensions one chooses, that the dimensions are all needed. We need to, we need to have coverage of most, most of the time, in order for us to feel or have a sense of overall wellness. Now, you may look at that list and think, oh, okay, I'm not very good at that and uh, don't really do much of that. One hopes that as a head teacher, you have occupational wellness and that you enjoy your job and you find the challenge of your job um, um, good and right financially. That needs we need financial don't we in order for it to be um <clears throat> for us to be able to pay the mortgage uh, put food on the table all of these things but beyond that do we tap into these other areas now physical we talked about that last time but up in our movement social well connecting with people outside of school about things not to do with school. I wonder if you had to pick one, which one would you think you need to work on most? But for today, we're going to look at trying to really tap into the intellectual well of well-being, the intellectual dimension of wellness on this particular diagram that we're using at the moment. How can we do that in a practical way? How can I encourage you to get interested in a practical way? Well, I'll start to ask yourself these questions. Most of curiosity starts with a question and then, our, um, and then we're motivated to want to answer that question when the question is written well. So what is curiosity? How can it be curious? And why is having a sense of curiosity important? You may want to just reflect on one of those questions now. What I found curious was the word curiosity can be spelt in two different ways. Um, and I'm still not 100% sure that I have full, uh, a full understanding of um, how you can have both ways. Um, but I've used a mixture along the way, as, uh, uh, as you will notice. But if anybody could explain that to me in the chat box, i would be very grateful to them um, if they would be able to explain that to me in a sense that I understood it 
for further use. But I think why is the hardest one. For, for me, why is having a sense of curiosity important is because it gives us motivation. It gives us that joie de vie. It gives us that intellectual um, uh, stimulation. It gives us that sense of learning. It gives us energy. It tops us up. And that is why curiosity is important. It gets your brain going and our brain is a, like a muscle and we need to exercise it. Okay. So let's have a quiz. So for those of you who don't know, True Pursuit was a game around asking you effectively quiz questions. Um, it was a big hit when it first came out. Um, and um, as you answered each of the questions, each had a category and those categories were set um, and you could effectively try and choose that category um, that you wanted to. So let's see if we can, um, if anybody knows their colours. So who thinks they know that what category geography was? So someone saying green, any others? Anyone else? No, we're going with green. Okay, anybody for entertainment? Entertainment colour was? Oh, we've got a we've got a pink, so we think it might. Oh, we've got two for pink. Okay, so we're pretty sure that entertainment is pink. Okay, history. Anyone? Okay, we've got a couple of browns. Interesting that two people are thinking the same thing. Um, so. They're either on the same Google site or they both think the same thing. That's interesting. Art and literature was originally one colour and then was changed, so I found out. Anybody know either of those two colours? Oh, we're going for yellow on that one. Okay, science and nature. Okay, we're going for blue for that one. And that just leaves the last one there, which was always my favourite for some reason. Um, sport and leisure, folks. What are we going for sport and leisure? So one colleague is going for orange. I can tell you, colleague, that it was most definitely orange. Orange seemed to be the only one I got on a regular basis. The others were a bit of a battle. Anyway, there's the answer. Um, if you want to congratulate yourself um, on how clever you've been um, and how well you know your true pursuit. I then took the idea further forwards and I explored, well, how did this game come about? Okay, so um, find yourself or um, either find yourself a piece of paper and just write it down for self-affirmation, um, but just have a little think about whether the next five or I think five or six statements are either true or are they false? Okay. So if you want the glory, you can come onto the chat box and you can let me know. Um, but if you'd rather keep it just quiet and private, then that's also good to go. There are only two choices. So even if you don't know true or pursuit, you can have a think about it um, and have a go. It's inclusive in that way. <laughs> so the game Trial Pursuit was created in 1979 by Chris Hanney and Scott Abbott, two Canadian newspaper editors. So true or false? Okay, and second question. The design of the game, or the game board, is based on a ship's wheel. Six separate spokes leading to the centre or winner's circle. True or false? Thank you. 
The artwork for the game was drawn by an unemployed 18 year old. Sounds unlikely, doesn't it? And then maybe it was. Okay, number four. It needs $75,000 to create a prototype board game, pieces and cards. In the end, 34 people invested and four years later, each got a five digit dividend check from their, for their investment. Where do you think a 34th of 75,000 pounds? It became a very sound investment. And number five, originally the game cost about 48 pounds to make and was only sold for 10 pounds. So the game lost 38 pounds per copy that it sold. Which doesn't sound like a particularly uh, good economic model, does it? And I think this is the last one. <laughs> so number six. The original game had 6,000 questions printed on 1,000 cards. So you can work out because of the, the piece that I put there, that there were indeed six categories. So six times a thousand is indeed 6,000. So why am I doing this? Because I'm just trying to provoke your curiosity and that can be done with a question, something that is familiar or fairly familiar to some of you. And then we're just moving it through by just finding out something different uh, that we might not have known. So Trural Pursuit has some trivia associated with it, I guess. Um, and it's through curiosity that you find out the answers to these questions. The fact that it is true that two Canadian newspapers uh, editors uh, created it and it was a 1979 game when it was first came out, although most people think it's an 80s game. It was indeed true that it was a ship's wheel that was the inspiration for not only the pie pieces um, and the pieces, but also the board itself. It was also true, and this was the one that was most curious to me. Um, I was like, really? And I had to check it, um, but it is true that the artwork of the game was drawn by an unemployed 18 year old who did very well out of it um, and uh, suddenly was no longer unemployed. What did you get for number four? That is also true that it costs $75,000, but for the, four, uh, the 34 people who invested in that, they got a fair figure. Um, four years later, it was a fantastic investment for those um, for those early investors, um, and they made a significant amount of money as a result of the game. Okay, someone come onto the chat box and be brave and tell me what you thought uh, number five was true or false, folks. So one colleague is going false. And unfortunately, that colleague has just killed the 100% record. Um, it, they did sell it at a £38 loss per game. Now, you would think, well, why did they do that? And the idea was that they would, um, they would sell enough copies to make it big. And eventually, once they made it big, they could make more copies. And because they could make more copies at that point, they could then cream the profit off later. That was incredibly brave strategy 
to go for, um, but on this occasion, it worked. And then finally, the original game did indeed have a thousand cards on it. Um, and there were six categories, therefore there were 6,000 questions in the game. So there we go. There's my Trial Pursuit, Trial Pursuit quiz to get you to going. Anybody get all of them right? Oh, we've got a 50-50 from one colleague. Any others? The important thing is, colleagues, that you've now got some curious and interesting facts to tell others. And um, it may not have been your curiosity or interest, um, but the same moral or the same, uh, the same connections arise. Curiosity, especially intellectual inquisitiveness, which is a phrase that I really, really like, and in hindsight maybe should have called the webinar intellectual inquisitiveness, is what separates the truly alive from those who are merely going through the motions. So if you believe Tom Robbins, he believes it's about being truly alive. <coughs> Excuse me, about being truly alive. And I know when I'm interested in something, I know when I'm curious about Spitalfield, the area in London, or uh, disability in Tudor times, which seems to be something that I've got myself interested in. I do feel truly alive. I read with a passion and I want to Google stuff to find out the context in which we found it. Um, but I know that I'm, of, I'm, I'm curious with a capital C and I know that not everybody is, but I hope my enthusiasm for knowledge is starting to rub off. So what do you already do? to promote intellectual curiosity in your world. Let's just have a reflection now to think, well, what do you already do? Because I certainly shouldn't make the judgment that I already know. I should be asking you the question of what do you already do? And again, you can put that into the chat box to think about it and consider it, or you may just want to uh, just take a moment to think, well, what do I do? And even if it's in holidays and high days, and that's okay, but what do you do? What's the last non-fiction book you read? What's the do last documentary that you watched? And for some of you, it might be quite a journey back. <laughs> to find out what that is and don't chastise yourself for that. More make yourself a promise that you need to get it back in to your, uh, your weekly schedule at some point. So thank you. So podcasts are an excellent way, colleague. Thank you. Podcasts are wonderful, aren't they? What a, what a great way of having um, an opportunity for somebody who knows quite a lot about something to share that quite a lot about something with us and allow us to really uh, get to grips with it in a very short space of time. So, yeah, absolutely. I think it's, I think it's brilliant, isn't it? Wow. And then George III. I think lots of monarchs, lots of monarchs um, are misunderstood. I teach history at the, uh, I teach teachers how to teach history effectively. Um, and I think we've got a lot of misunderstandings about history, <laughs> but about royalty as well. So uh, thank you. That's really interesting. Audible, absolutely colleague. Um, absolute revelation. I love the idea of listening to books in the car instead of the radio. Ah, oh, I love that. I love that. It started to make journeys worthwhile. 
you don't get there with a sense of frustration you get there with a sense of believing that you've learned something it's been purposeful it gives an extra reason to be on the road um, to give you an opportunity to do that wow wow thank you so much for these wonderful ideas exploring your family tree thank you colleague i'd love to do that one of my uncles has done that and he's explored so much of our family tree um and um i've got a picture a photograph of my victorian uh, great great granddad um which is just an incredible piece of history <laughs> I love the idea here, colleague, that you talked about listening to something that was way above my league. But surely, if we're learning, if we're genuinely learning, it's got to be above what we normally do, hasn't it? If my, I know, um, I know that if I'm busy, it takes me a while to get over the inertia of stopping my work brain whirring and starting the intellectual brain whirring. And I need to make that transition between this one and this one. Because when this one is whirring, it's very difficult to get this one started. But when this one is started, it's very difficult for school to come in. But if you then consider that, surely that's a good thing that the intellectual brain is spinning and you're having to think about it. You know, watching a subtitled film, for example, is harder. It's doable, but you have to focus on it. But in order to focus on that, it stops you from thinking about that and that maybe that's what well-being is all about. It's about taking school out and putting something else in. And if we can do that, then we're in a better place. Wow. Thank you for all those lovely suggestions. BBC Sound is free and brilliant. I completely agree with you, colleagues. Um, that's fantastic. Crosswords, reading, absolutely. I think reading a harder book um, is, is incredibly challenging. I went through a phase of re reading Dickens and Dickens has sentences that are so long you have to take a kind of you have to take a coffee break in the middle of a sentence um, and try to work out what on earth um, is saying but the lyrical language once you get into it is just so beautiful um, so I think that uh, yeah reading can be good but if we're reading just uh, light stuff that's not really giving us the intellectual banter, um, but it is giving us other things. I, I do agree with that. It is giving us other things, but it's not giving us that intellectual challenge. Lovely. Thank you for that interaction. That was really good to hear from you. Okay. I found out that NASA have done an incredible project. So they've sent a vehicle that you can see here um to mars and it's now sending pictures back and these pictures are the best quality pictures that have ever ever come back from the surface of mars and unbelievably this is a selfie <laughs> essentially this is a selfie of the robot that has been sent up to mars and i can't believe what i'm what i'm looking at here I'm a photographer at, at times and the sharpness of this image is quite something but does anybody know what the robot is called has anybody followed it does anybody know what the robot is called you may not it's gone a little bit under the radar and i just want to kind of bring it back on to your understanding Haha, ha, I love the idea of being called Lucy. I'm almost disappointed that it's not called Lucy, to be fair. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you, Cody. Um, yeah, um, it's called Curiosity. So that's why I that's why I, I picked it. 
um, because it's named after the theme that we're running with. It's about curiosity. It's about taking our taking humanity further, taking humanity to another level, potentially another planet. Um, and I think that that's um, I think that's great. So let's have a look at the quality of the image as you zoom in. So once it had that selfie, it then zoomed in. This isn't me zooming in. This is it zooming in. But look at the detail. I mean, how on earth can it take that level of detail and then send that picture back? In one of the chapters I was exploring when I was writing my book, when we were going to um, <clears throat> when we were going to the surface of other planets, the the information that came back was so poor, and we would describe it as incredibly pixelated that they almost did a kind of paint by numbers image of the data that came back and so it's a very kind of pixelated block blocky image of the surface of the moon but here i mean it's incredible levels of detail um, and hopefully that's provoked your curiosity um, in the curiosity mission that is currently on Mars. All of these images are freely available folks and unbelievably what you can do is you can you can scan round on the image so the quality of the image even allows you to do a full 360 panorama of, of what's there and I think if you could do that with children that they would be interested and just one last click you can get the, the track of the tyres I don't know about you but that was for me was something pretty amazing. Whenever we talk about education, we always come back to this wonderful man, don't we? Do you agree with him? Is it the engine of achievement? I think certainly there's a sense of achievement when we've tackled a difficult book, we've watched a tricky film or a tricky, uh, a challenging film in terms of its content or in terms of its language. I think there's a sense of curiosity, oh, a, sorry, an um, a sense of achievement when we've, we've learned something new to the point where we want to tell somebody else what we've learned. I think that can be a sense of achievement. But most importantly, I think that that sense of achievement comes with a sense of well-being, a sense of satisfaction, a sense of um, satiation of our intellectual desire to put something in here that is of interest, could potentially be a conversational piece with others because we've got ourselves enthusiastic and engaged with, into it. And therefore we have an understanding of it that can get others involved and others wanting to know more. And that's where we really know we've got it. Now I guess folks, it's a time for you to reflect and to consider what do you do to promote intellectual curiosity in your world? And by promoting it, I think I'm suggesting that we need to put, put it higher up the rankings. We need to consider it in terms of putting it up a little bit higher than it is already. And I say that knowing that you're busy. But I say that because I know that it can be good for you to do it for the reasons that I've um, I'll, I'll try to articulate to you uh, this morning. So just have a think about how you could promote intellectual well-being going forwards. Is there something you already want to explore more as a result of today? Either a topic of my, of something we've covered today, or something that you've just done actually yeah 
I haven't done anything on that. I used to be really into that. I've not really covered it for a while. Well, dive back into it, folks. It will do you good. One colleague mentioned Audible and the benefits of listening to an audio book as you're driving. And I drive, well, pre-COVID, I drove more than I'm driving now to various conferences and locations and ITT providers and schools and all over the place. And so the idea of Audible was something I was very interested in because I could listen to disability about in Tudor times at the same time as driving, or I could listen to um, um, an area of interest as well as driving. And this one, this advert was really powerful for me. Um, it was like kind of the coldness of just kind of swiping and clicking and Facebooking and, and Twittering in general terms. And I think there's lots of good on social media as much as there is bad. But I did get that sense of warmth on the right hand side there. I think there's an intellectual glow that can come when we're listening to BBC Sounds, like one colleague had said, when we're listening to Bill Bryson giving us the short history of something, when we're learning about our family tree, because it's relevance to us, because we're in it, it's part of who we are, gives us a sense of belonging that these things give us a glow, a, a, a readiness, a sense of achievement, as Bill Bryson was, um, not Bill Bryson, Ken Robinson was saying. And I think this is what I want you to try to tap into. I think that this is what I want you to explore and to consider beyond today, because today is just a one-off um, <clears throat> in terms of encouraging you to be intellectually curious but with the opportunity of half term coming you could get into a good um a good habit bouncing off from this point that's my hope anyway <laughs> and when i'm teaching teachers how to teach history they never believe me before i show them that the word curiosity is in the national curriculum for history. So it's even worthy of the national curriculum. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that that should be, um, that that should be your motivation and that your, and that should be your reasoning, but the purpose of study in both the history curriculum and the geography curriculum encourages us to have a curiosity about the past. And I certainly do for my job. Yes beyond the job yes because i've started exploring things i really want to explore george the third because my knowledge of george the third isn't as good as the colleague who's mentioned it so i have that desire for knowledge to know more about the past or more about the world and if you don't believe me there is the geography curriculum and i've circled it for you how do we get to a fascination about the world? Well, I used to watch Newsround, which kind of tells you how old I am, really. Um, John Craven's Newsround. And he gave me a fascination of the world because I went to parts of the world that I've never been to before in my lounge, in my living room. And therefore, I started to be, I started to be interested in other people and other ways of living and other houses and other things that I had no access to before. So that's possibly why I have a fascination about the world in which I live. But that may, for some of you, be motivation. So what could you do to promote your intellectual curiosity in the world? taking it further forwards. You can call it a bucket list if you like. Some people do. The 100 books bucket list. And it's like a scratch card. Um, and 
you could buy the scratch card and then you have to try and read the 100 books that it chooses. And I know that reading uh, um, reading groups were quite a thing, weren't they, at some point? Um, and you were really more challenging reads in order to be more intellectual um, as a result of that. But that's quite a nice idea. I don't know how many of those you've read, but I looked up what the, uh, the BBC's Big Read uh, recommended list was. And then I was shocked to know how few of those books that I've actually read. I've heard of all of them. Have I read them all? No, <laughs> I certainly haven't. Would I want to read them all? Well, I guess that if they're recommended, then they must be pretty good. Um, and maybe I should give it a go. Have a look down that list. How many of, how many of those titles have you read? That's very impressive, colleague. Did you think that the sequel to, or is it a prequel or a sequel? I can't remember which, um, to number six. Was that as good? You're gonna get um, all of the slides, folks. So you can have a look. Um, you can have a look for yourself. Um, and uh, maybe tick it off in your own time. Nice to see a, a Dickens in there, but I guess not surprised. Number five. Yes, there's a lot of Harry Potter fans out there. Um, and I'm one of the few people that are very nonchalant about Harry Potter. It didn't really do much for me, um, I have to say. So um, I'm not a great one, uh, colleague to join you in the Harry Potter fan club. Uh, much to the disappointment of uh, the children in my school when I was head teacher, not to like Harry Potter was like saying that I was a pariah of some sort in, in their world. <laughs> you don't believe me? Believe Google. They're quite a popular company. I don't know if you've heard of them, um, but they're quite a popular company. What would you Google? What do you want to know? And we have the power, we have access to so much information, don't we? But if we've got so much access to so much information, the only thing we need to do is generate the questions and generate the enthusiasm. It never surprises me the power of the internet, if you can harness that power. It's just unbelievable. It's a wildebeest out of control at times but if you can learn to control google and search engines then ah oh, it's an incredible it's an incredible tool um, that we can utilize Is that true Believe, do you believe them? Is it about caring? Okay. Curious about people in the world. Curious about people who have done fantastic things. The problem is the world is very big and the problem is that there are lots of fantastic people and the problem is that there are lots of fantastic people doing lots of fantastic things. So the problem is that we don't know many people. <laughs> we don't know many of the people that have done fantastic things. But the good news is that if you flip that on its head, what we end up with is a world of understanding, a world of stuff, a world of people who we can learn about and get interested in and to try to understand. Of that list, folks, how many do you know? Or of that list, how many do you know their achievement? I 
I would hazard a guess, and I may be wrong, folks, and I really strongly don't want to put you off. This is much more wanting you to find out, but potentially challenge something that is fairly uncomfortable for me to recognize in myself, and I'll put it on me for a moment. When I, when I first looked at this list, I knew three, possibly four. I wasn't 100% sure of the fourth. I got four. But that's not bad. But the reaction to myself was, but I want to know all six. The good news is, folks, that I'm going to share with you all six. Well, her clothing suggests that uh, um, she was um, <clears throat> she was an astronaut. Okay, but why don't we know her? Yet we know other astronauts. That's what we need to question of ourselves. Maya Angelou wrote some wonderful books, very peaceful, harmonious, celebratory books. Certainly didn't know that it was 36 of which 30 were bestsellers, but nonetheless. Claudette Covin, well, you may know of Rosa Parks because um, Rosa Parks is, is, is better known, um, but this lady was still trying to be an activist in the civil rights movement um, at a similar time. Matthew Henson went to the Arctic <clears throat> with Amundsen. Amundsen got all the credit. Matthew Henson was not recognized for his achievements within his lifetime. Only posthumously was he given credit for what he uh, contributed to that um, historical occasion. Catherine Johnson was part of NASA and was a significant part of the Apollo, um, Apollo moon landing project and behind the scenes was doing the maths. Um, and um, if you want to watch a film over the course of your half term folks, then Hidden Figures is the film of her life and her experiences of being in a very male dominated world in the 1960s. And Daniel Hale Williams um, was the first, opened a um, hospital with racially integrated staff. And that gives you the glue that runs between all of these figures that I've told you about. It's black history. And I think that it opens up a world for us to explore. You can get politically active about it. You can get frustrated about it. But for me, there's a curiosity of a whole new world that I didn't know because it wasn't in my history books but they are now and they could be now um, and therefore as of interest to me as a result of that. Thank you for colleagues that have contributed to say that they didn't know many. That's understandable. Don't be critical of yourself. Just see it as an opportunity to explore these wonderful, uh, these wonderful things. The there's a children's book about Matthew Henson that was so powerful I cried. I cried at frustration of the experiences that he had in his life. Um, so I would recommend that. I think it's Frozen in the Ice or something along those lines is the title of the book. Now here's Watson telling us that we, are in, we need to engage in good questioning. Just ask yourself questions, folks. So as we head toward the end of this uh, talk um, about an encouragement to move further forwards, um, I, I think that for many of you, you have half term next week. So just make a promise to yourself that something I've covered today is worthy of your exploration. 
something that we've covered today could be a stimulus for you to find out something next week in half term and then potentially build momentum into a wider sense of um, curiosity so that you can maintain that level of curiosity leading into uh, um, term time rather than just weekends, holidays and high days. But you may not be listening because you may be looking at the picture of an ingredient that my daughter wanted, required for the curry that she wanted to make that she found in a Mother Jaffrey uh, curry book. I've never heard of it before. Have I got to my age and never heard of these things? Well, reassure me folks that nobody else knows what this, um, this ingredient is or does someone know? Well, it's part of the celery family. Its uh, flavour is reminiscent of leeks and onions. And it tastes absolutely fantastic in a curry. And I would highly recommend it um, to look that up. It's in Buna, um, a chicken Buna curry. Um, and you've probably tasted it, but you don't know what it is as part of the ingredients. Um, but don't go for the colloquial name for this ingredient because the colloquial name for the ingredient is called devil's dung, which may have put you off uh, making yourself a curry with asafoeta or asafoeta, however you say it. Um, I hope that I've stimulated your mind. I hope that I have provoked a sense of curiosity in all of you. And I hope that you are motivated to want to try to push forwards um, in your pursuit of being more curious. Thank you for taking the time to rest, um, rest and recover and give yourself this moment. And I hope that you, you find it worthy use of your time, folks. If you want to contact me, there are the details. But I, in the meantime, I will pass you back to Paul to sign off from here. Thank you. Thank you, David. That's very welcoming this morning and have given us a lot to think about. I've just launched the poll. If you wouldn't mind completing the poll and uh, helping us to uh, mould our CPD. There are two more sessions in this series, one in November and one in December. And David would welcome to visit for you to attend these sessions and increase your well-being and knowledge about this subject. OK, has anyone got any other questions they want to ask about this series of events or any other events that we're running this year? No, no one wants to come on board and speak to us. If not, thank you very much for attending today. We hope it's given you some food for thought and we hope to see you again at another session. And thank you again, David. Pleasure. Thank you, colleagues.